Thanks for coming today. Uh, this is the 16th annual uh, Travers Conference on Ethics and Accountability. And uh, my name is Kerry Curtis. I'm a, a member of the board of the Commonwealth Club of California, who's one of the sponsors of this, uh, this event. And we have with us uh, today members of the Travers family here, who uh, through their generosity, this event is uh, underwritten. So I wanted to thank them for their generosity. Um, this is the, as I said, the 16th annual conference. And uh, at a time like this, when ethics in uh, government and in society generally seems uh, not to be trending upward, uh, it's important to keep the topic uh, alive and in our, in our attention uh, all the time. The focus today is on energy. And so the, uh, the question is really is about uh, California's energy policy and the energy future. And I remember when I was at the, uh, the Copenhagen conference, uh, it was that two or three years ago, three years ago, I guess, something like that. Um, the Commonwealth Club had a delegation there that I was a part of, and we were running an, a, uh, an event featuring Governor Schwarzenegger and uh, a, a, a governor of a province of Brazil. So the, 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 the consensus there, the question was, does it make sense for a subnational entity like a state or a province to have its own energy policy, or is that more logically the function of a, of a national government? And so the consensus there was, yeah, it does make sense for a subnational entity to have a, uh, an energy policy. Um, and uh, so, but I will, I will not presume to, uh, to speak authoritatively and not. Instead, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Severin Bornstein, who is a uh, professor, uh, energy professor here at Berkeley, and one of the leading experts in the world on energy policy and uh, everything to do with that. So without further ado, uh, Professor Bornstein. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm actually not going to use slides, so I'm going to close that. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me, and thanks to the Travers family and for the support of this conference. Uh, I was going to start out when I started preparing this. Uh, I was going to spend some time summarizing the current state of energy and future options for California. Uh, then I noticed that Jane Long is going to be the lunchtime speaker, and Jane is the lead author of a major study on that subject. So. I'm going to do a little of it anyway, but um, I'm going to fill in fewer details than I'm sure Jane is going to when she speaks at lunchtime. Uh, what I want to do instead, or as well, is focus uh, in some ways on the theme of this conference more generally, that is uh, the ethics and uh, policy, and ask the question of uh, what, if we're going to have an energy policy in California, what the goal should be. Let me start out by noting four distinct energy challenges that people talk about in California when you ask about uh, what, uh, what our goals are. One is cost control. And that's the one that probably gets the most media attention. I know personally because every time the price of gasoline goes up, I get to be on television saying the price of gasoline has gone up. Um, <laughs> A second is local air pollution. And when I first became director of the California, U University of California Energy Institute almost 20 years ago, um, that was a big focus, uh, particularly on the transportation fuel side uh, with emissions from cars. Uh, in 1995, we adopted a new uh, form of cleaner burning gasoline that had, has had a really dramatic impact on California air quality. Uh, and has addressed that uh, quite significantly. A third concern is energy security or independence. And I'm going to come back and talk about this a little more. It's a term that is thrown around by lots of policymakers, I would say, more frequently than not without much understanding of what they mean by it. Um, and then finally, and the one that most people now think of when we talk about uh, energy policy in California, is climate change. Uh, is addressing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's important to remember that a lot of the policy that's in place now didn't begin worrying about climate change. It started by worrying about these other factors uh, and, ha and has actually changed over the years to be adapted to the issue of climate change. Until probably five or six years ago, well, probably seven or eight now, 
uh, the focus in the state was primarily on cost control and local air pollution. Uh, and in a sense, that made sense at the time. They were, fa they were things that we could definitely do something about. Uh, since the 70s, California has been, or actually the 60s, California has been very focused on air pollution from energy sources, and particularly tailpipe emissions from cars and has in many ways been a leader in addressing those issues. Uh, when I became director of the Energy Institute in 1994, I actually had done a lot of work on the oil and gasoline side and very little on the electricity side, and I immediately had to go up and testify in Sacramento on electricity restructuring because it was the beginning of the electricity deregulation movement in California. The focus of that was primarily cost control was primarily how do we build out electricity and supply electricity needs while keeping costs as low as possible. That was all being done in the shadow of the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant debacle that ended up costing consumers in PG&E territory billions of dollars. And so there was a lot of uh, discussion of, well, if we do this, would it actually reduce costs over time? And that was really where almost all of the discussion was focused. How do you make markets work efficiently to get costs down? In the 1990s, we saw electricity deregulation actually come into effect in California, uh, starting in March uh, or in April of 1998. Uh, we also moved, as I mentioned, to a cleaner burning gasoline in 1996. I was also uh, a member of the Attorney General's Gasoline Task Force in 1999, investigating high gas prices. And so you can see that a lot of the focus, almost all of the focus then, was on high costs and on pollution issues, uh, local pollution issues. Uh, then we had the California electricity crisis in, 1990, or in, 2000, in 2001 and largely a large step back from electricity markets. Uh, we've had occasional gasoline price spikes ever since, uh, most recently last fall. Um, and although people seem to be less aware of this than the price spikes, we have persistently higher gasoline prices than in the rest of the country, uh, not just because of taxes, even adjusting for taxes, our prices tend to run 10 to 15 cents higher than the rest of the country. We also have persistently cleaner tailpipe emissions than the rest of the country. Not as clean as they could be if we changed a few regulations, particularly taking the oldest uh, heavy polluters off the road, but much cleaner than the emissions in the rest of the country uh, due to the clean, cleaner gasoline we use. And the effect of that has been shown to, to be very significant health improvements. Uh, and so that's been a major victory in California uh, environmental policy. Starting uh, shortly after the California electricity crisis, the focus turned to greenhouse gases. In 2006, we passed the AB 32, the California Global Climate Solutions Act, uh, and we've taken a number of steps since then to move towards a lower greenhouse gas emissions um, energy system. We passed the 20% renewable portfolio standard in 2002 that required that 20% of electricity come from, from renewable sources. And then we started debating what a renewable source is um, and what the goal of this policy really should be. We increased it to 33% in 2011. Uh, the 2002 20% standard was supposed to be met by 2012. We didn't quite make it, um, but we're pretty much there now. Uh, the 33 percent standard passed in 2011 is a standard for 2020, and I think most people think that we can make that. Uh, we had a number of other uh, energy initiatives. The California Solar Initiative, which has subsidized or had rebates on uh, residential and commercial installations of solar. Uh, we have uh, two bill, uh, two uh, phases of standards for energy or for fuel economy in cars in California to improve California fuel economy. We have a low carbon fuel standard that uh, at least purports to improve the carbon footprint of the fuel that we use in our cars by mixing in more fuels that come from low carbon sources. 
We have for, year, for decades had energy efficiency programs in California. Those programs continue um, the, with new attempts to figure out what is most effective and where energy efficiency can be applied most efficiently. And then most recently, uh, uh, last year, we began the California's cap and trade program, which is a program to cap the total emissions of greenhouse gases from California and then allow tradable permits to reallocate those emissions rights in a way that would uh, reduce the cost of those greenhouse gas emissions reductions. But of course, California exists in a larger global context. And well, when we were worried about the cost of energy and doing specific things about energy production in California, and when we were worried about local pollutants, we could largely do that on a state, alone, on a state level basis and focus on what we need to do and ignore the rest of the world. Uh, we can't really do that when we talk about greenhouse gases. Uh, in fact, when we, when we recognize, and I think most people do, that California's uh, greenhouse gas initiatives have to be thought of in the larger context, there are a number of different reactions, and it's almost a Rorschach test. There are the people who say that, well, that just shows we can't have any real effect and we shouldn't bother having an energy policy as it, per as it pertains to greenhouse gases. There are other people who say we are morally obligated to clean up our own house. Uh, that we have been the source of very large uh, greenhouse gases, and we need to do something to address that. A slight twist on that that I think is in some ways a more practical political application of it is that we have to clean up our own house to have credibility with the rest of the world. That if we're going to have our, uh, if we're going to try to make a difference in the rest of the world, the first thing we have to do is lower our own ca carbon footprint. It's not clear to me how important that is in terms of a demonstration, or in terms of being able to pressure the rest of the world. I don't think California is in a political position to apply much pressure. I think more importantly is, more important is a demonstration effect. The idea that if California can clean up our greenhouse gas emissions, that uh, we may be able to le show a path for others to do it. The distinction may seem sort of fuzzy, but I think it's actually critical. Because when we think about policies, and this is where I'm going to go with this discussion, I think we need to think about not can California reduce our greenhouse gas footprint, or how should we get to a certain percentage, but how, what effect is that going to really have on climate change globally? And important, I think the, the point of that is that when we think about California energy policy as it pertains to greenhouse gas emissions, the word that, we have, that I have to keep coming back to is innovation. What are we going to do that is going to spur innovation that can be applied in the rest of the world? That isn't just because California is a very small and declining share of world greenhouse gases, but because it's important to keep our eye on policy objectives when we design policy. Let me tell you two anecdotes of this. I was in a meeting at the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, I was actually on, a co on the conference call, but part of a meeting of about 10 uh, policy analysts about solar PV. And although the meeting was about greenhouse gases and the application of solar PV, it very quickly moved to a discussion of how do we maximize the amount of solar PV in the system, including some policies that I thought were really bad policies, in fact, would take away from other initiatives that would probably be more effective in reducing greenhouse gases. But the problem was that almost all the other participants in this meeting were solar PV advocates, not greenhouse gas reduction advocates. And so their goal was to get as much solar PV into the market. Now, their justification, if you really pressed them on, at least the more sophisticated people, would be, well, we need to do this. This is part of the effort to reduce greenhouse gases. But in my opinion, some of the things that they were suggesting actually were likely to undermine the overall goal of greenhouse gas reduction in, uh, in exchange for a very short-run boost to installations in a certain area. 
Uh, and I think a lot of the policies we now talk about have this problem, that they end up focusing on sub-goals, which in some larger theoretical context may be part of the picture, but when applied incorrectly can actually undermine the, the realistic or the important long-run goal, which as I said, I think from California's standpoint has to be innovation. It has to be creating the technologies that can change the rest of the world, not just reducing our footprint. It, it will make us feel good if California can reduce our greenhouse gas footprint by 30%, 50%, or whatever, but if we do it in a way that isn't exportable, it's not going to have any effect on the rest of the world. Exportable both in terms of the technologies and in terms of the demonstration effect. If we do something that allows us to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint, but the developing world looks at it and says, that's you know, so expensive, there's no chance we would ever adopt it, or that's very California specific to some way we live in California, it's really not going to be very useful in actually reducing greenhouse gases in a way that changes the world. About 10 years ago, I was sitting in the office of a commissioner of a California organization, state organization, and I'm not going to be any more specific than that, discussing the renewable portfolio standard with this commissioner. And I asked the commissioner, well, what's the goal? This was shortly after or right around the time the first RPS was passed in 2002. And I asked the commissioner, well, what's the goal of the RPS? And the commissioner sort of came up short and looked at me like I was an idiot and said, well, of course, it's to reduce our reliance on foreign energy sources. That's a laugh line for those of you who... Um, California doesn't act... At the time and now, California actually doesn't import energy from outside the country to produce electricity. And the RPS applied to electricity. The reduce our reliance on foreign energy sources generally applies to oil, and California even then used no oil to produce electricity. Um, being the smart ass I am, and being unable to help myself, the one thing that we did do at the time was import natural gas from Canada. So I said, that's right. You can't trust those Canadians. They could turn on us at any moment. Uh, and that didn't receive a great response from this commissioner. But I think it really does make the point that uh, this commissioner, at least, was deeply confused about what the goal of the RPS was and, why we, and what we might accomplish with it. Because the one thing we were definitely not going to accomplish with an RPS was reducing our reliance on foreign energy sources. Uh, there were lots of arguments for it, but uh, that wasn't it. But certainly, if this commissioner, and this commissioner was in a decision-making position at the time, you would want them to have an understanding of why we're doing this in the first place. So what is the goal now? Um, ultimately, I think it has to be, well, we still do have to worry about cost control, and while we still do have to worry about local air pollution, um, the primary focus is maintaining levels on those criteria while creating solutions to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I think that, unfortunately, the focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, has been more in how do we get California's footprint down than on how do, do, how do we become a laboratory for solutions that can be exported worldwide. Uh, and there's, a lot, there's some overlap, but I think it's very easy to become focused on reducing California emissions as the goal and, as a result, lose track of where we really should be going. Cap-and-trade is uh, an example of both the good and the bad, I think, here. When cap-and-trade was first passed as part of AB 32 and implementation was discussed five years ago, most economists who study this in California said, well, it could be useful as a model for what the rest of the country can do and potentially what we can do worldwide. Cap and trade in California alone was going to, and now it does, have quite a few problems in running a market on a state level basis due to the trade that occurs across state boundaries 
and the inability of a state under the US Constitution to actually control that trade. Um, on the other hand, if it actually set up a model that the country could follow, then when that new Democrat or even Republican in 2008 who believed in cap and trade, you may recall that both presidential candidates actually were pushing for cap and trade in 2008, uh, got elected and pushed cap and trade, California in 2009 would be the example of how to do it. Well, you know the history since then. Uh, that new Democrat did get elected. We didn't get cap and trade. If anything, we are further from it now than we were in 2007, probably a lot further. Um, and we've gone ahead with the California cap and trade market. Now, I'm not going to say we should have suddenly shut it down, but we do have to think hard about what, what, what's the goal now? Um, and how useful is it to have a goal of reducing California's greenhouse gas emissions if it's not really going to be a useful example for elsewhere in the world? Particularly because what we have learned from the California cap and trade market is that it is very difficult to run a state level market. Uh, leakage, that is the movement of economic activity outside the state, is a tremendous problem. And a bigger problem is what's called resource shuffling or reshuffling. That is the case where nothing actually changes in physical activity or business activity, but purchases change. So if we now don't buy our power from the coal-fired power plant in Utah, but that power plant continues to operate, and we buy our power from the hydro plant, and the people in Arizona buy their power from that coal plant, then all we've done is reshuffled the power and had no effect on actual emissions. Likewise, this problem comes up with the low carbon fuel standard. If we put a different number on tar sands oil in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions than on light sweet crude from uh, Texas, then we're going to end up only buying gasoline made from the crude from Texas but all that's going to do is reshuffle the Canadian crude somewhere else. There is a chance that will reduce the demand for Canadian crude a bit, but in a world oil market where there are plenty of people willing to buy it, it's really not going to change total emissions. And there's also a chance it could increase total emissions if it increases the shipping cost, if it moves crude around in a way that's less efficient than it was being moved around. Likewise, uh, the LCFS has a different standard for corn ethanol that's made in a coal-fired uh, refinery than is made in a gas-fired refinery. Uh, the stuff that comes out is, is exactly the same. But of course, if we buy the gas-fired ethanol, then somebody else buys the coal-fired ethanol. That's not a critique of these programs so much as a recognition that on a state level, it's very hard to actually implement these policies. And I think that drives home the point that we need to be more focused on how do we actually create solutions that are exportable to the rest of the world. People talk about how China is interested in cleaning up their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they generally, in the process, sort of confuse local air pollution and greenhouse gases. There's no question China has a horrific local air pollution problem. There also is no question there are much less expensive ways to greatly address that than to move to renewables right now. Um, in fact, I take a very different conclusion from the whole China example, uh, and that is that even in China, an uh, authoritarian country, it's very difficult to corral all the governments. The, uh, China, as a national policy, wants to do lots of things to reduce their coal-fired generation. And when you point out that they're continuing to build new coal-fired power plants, a lot of the answer is uh, they can't get the local governments to cooperate. I think that has to be a lesson to us that of how difficult it is going to be to get worldwide cooperation, that it's not even going to be uh, enough to get national cooperation among a lot of countries with very different incentives. Because even if these countries agree, it's not clear their local, uh, the local governments are going to agree. You know, I'd like to price carbon as much as any economist, possibly more than some. 
um, and possibly higher than most, um, but I've become less and less optimistic that we're going to be able to do it effectively. Um, I, I, this is not an argument against it as a, um, as a concept, but I think we have to be realistic about what we can really accomplish. California has implemented a cap and trade program that is pricing carbon. Uh, I was reminded in talking to people in California of 1998 and electricity deregulation when I was told by a politician that you only want to deregulate a market with ex when you have a lot of excess capacity, so you can keep prices very low. Of course, the whole point of deregulating a market is to let the market determine prices, um, and sometimes those prices will go up in order to incent, and that will incent new capacity. Um, we're seeing a lot of the same discussion here. We want cap and trade as long as the price is very low, and of course, if the price gets high, well, that's not going to work. Um, and so that has led me to, along with the recognition of leakage and, and um, reshuffling and the political resistance, to think about what should we be doing and what can we do. And that again brings me back to innovation. And let me tell you a non-energy uh, anecdote that I think will ring true for a lot of people. So uh, many of you, although there's some young people in the audience, remember film. Film used to be what you put in cameras. Um, we don't do that anymore. Now we have digital photography, and we all have one in our pocket right now. Um, that didn't used to be the case. So there's a company named Kodak that used to make film, um, and they're not really in that business anymore. What happened, let's set aside for a moment what happened. Let's think of another scenario. What if we had found out that silver halide, which, was the, which is an ingredient in making film light sensitive, turned out to be a pollutant? And let's say that we had started a market. We needed, a, we needed to reduce silver halide, and we had started a cap and trade market in silver halide, or a tax, and that that had put Kodak out of business, or had started to. Long before I put Kodak out of business, Kodak would have been in Washington, D.C., saying, you know, you're killing us. Government regulation is driving us out of business. And as much as I, as an economist, would say, look, it's not government regulation. We are pricing something that you had been getting for free, the right to pollute, and we're just not giving it to you for free anymore. And yes, in this case, that required some government intervention. But I think realistically, the argument that regulation's killing us would have carried a lot of weight. That's not what happened. What happened was there was this revolution in technology, and a new technology came in that drove film out of business. Kodak complained. A few companies tried to get Washington, D.C. to intervene, but all the government had to do was nothing. They just had to stay out of the way, and all the film disappeared, and that industry was crushed in a way that I just don't think you could have done through a government policy, even if it had been a pollutant. Uh, or at least it would have been much more difficult. And so I think that makes the point that the commitment to research and development, to innovation that can ultimately reduce greenhouse gases, is probably a more credible commitment to reduce greenhouse gases than one that says we're going to price greenhouse gases, much as I would love to do it, and I think it's a good idea, and I think we should be doing it as well, I'm worried that it's not going to be a consistent policy. And I think at a state level, policies that don't focus on innovation are much less likely to be effective. And that's not just a wrap on cap and trade or on taxes. It's also on a lot of the command and control uh, regulation that, we've, uh, that we have implemented, because it really hasn't been done with this focus on uh, innovating for the rest of the world. So what, what does it mean? Um, well, if California went this direction and focused more on worldwide solutions, first of all, I think it's more likely to address climate change. I think that we're more likely to be actually come up with things that can really change the world. California has a strength in that. It, this would play to our strength of technology and invention um, rather than a strength, at least in Berkeley, but probably not very well else, of self-sacrifice. Um, I, I think that ultimately that's not going to turn, doesn't turn out to have as much political traction. Um, 
And, and I think it's more likely to be a boost to the economy. I don't want to get too, uh, uh, much a, be too much of a cheerleader in that way. I think the reality is that none of these policies, cap and trade, uh, LCFS, none of them are going to destroy the California economy, and none of them are going to revolutionize the California economy. I think the effect is going to be in the second decimal point in GDP. I, I think the idea that we should be doing this for jobs or for econ economic growth sort of misses the point. Rob Stevens at Harvard has a great analogy. He says, you know, you're having a dinner party and your friends are coming over and you got to make the salad and you got to take a shower before they get there. That doesn't mean you should make the salad in the shower. <laughs> um, and that's what we're doing, I think, when we talk about green jobs. Um, we're sort of confusing something that is a perfectly good thing to do uh, with something else that we also need to think about. I think there's a question, well, what's the practical difference? If we actually reoriented our policy towards innovation and solving the world's greenhouse gas problems, what would be different? Um, I think the first difference is that the lead question on any policy would be, what will we learn from this? And is it relevant to the rest of the world? What can, if we go down a certain road, if we require a certain technology, is this something that's going to change not just California or the rest of the US, but particularly the developing world? Because the developing world is going to be the lead greenhouse gas producer uh, going forward. Um, to pick on one policy that I think would not survive that, um, residential solar PV installation. I think is a, tough, uh, is a tough argument to make, particularly the supposed innovation of new financing methods that lease instead of buy, that uh, take advantage of tax uh, breaks slash loopholes um, in order to help make solar more affordable in California. I think when you think of that in this context, it doesn't look very good. Uh, I think that still does mean there's room for directed support for alternative technologies. Uh, and I think, in fact, there's probably a bigger argument for that. If anything, I think it's an argument for creating something akin to the California Regenerative Medicine uh, Initiative in alternative energy. That is, focusing a lot more of the resources that we're putting in now on uh, developing these new technologies. Uh, it probably means more focus upstream. California has a lot of handicaps when it comes to becoming a manufacturing center, and it's going to be tough what to actually become the center of manufacturing. It's almost certain that whatever technologies do become the new leaders are going to be capital intensive, and I think California needs to focus on the intellectual property side of that, um, although if we can get some of the uh, the technology, the manufacturing as well, that would be great, uh, but that's going to require some other policy changes. It also requires picking winners, um, and picking winners is a sort of dirty word in the uh, greenhouse gas debate, um, and it, because it's open to abuse, and there's no question it's open to abuse. Uh, however, what we're doing now is also open to abuse, and I think it, there's a lot, it, when you see the political arguments that go on, in Sacramento and Washington, there's no question that there are entities in there that may have started out trying to change the world, but what they're trying to do now is just get the funding to stay in business, regardless of whether their technology really makes sense. Um, you know, I'll just close by saying, should California really be the ones doing this? And the answer is no. Um, I think the federal government should be the ones doing this. When Obama came into office, he talked about a $15 billion R&D initiative in renewable energy. We've gotten up to about $4 billion now. Uh, just to put it in context, $15 billion is $50 per person per year in the United States. If we are really worried about catastrophic climate change, that just doesn't seem like a lot of money. And, you know, and of course, the next, put it next to the Department of Defense budget and it disappears. Um, and we're just really not doing it. And I wish we were doing it nationally, but we're not. And given what's going on in Washington, I don't think we will soon. I think in some ways that means that California has an opportunity. Again, I don't want to oversell it as boosting our economy too much, 
but it is something that California has as a real strength. And when we think about where could California really make the contribution to changing the greenhouse gas uh, future, I think it's on the innovation side more than on the setting a goal to reduce California's greenhouse gas footprint and feeling great about it when we reach it. And with that, I'll stop and leave a little time for questions. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Or not. That didn't provoke it. Oh, it did provoke somebody. Good. Hello, um, my name is Maxine. Um, I have a question about the many cheaper ways to address um, pollution than en renewable energy in California, um, especially ones that are simple and could be exported to uh, developing countries. Do you have any examples in mind at this point? Wait, were you talking about local pollution or were you talking about greenhouse gases? I, I was, because um, when I, when Go I ahead. said there are many cheaper ways for China to address local okay. pollution, what I had in mind was the technologies we now use, which they okay. don't, uh, which would massively mm -hmm. reduce the pollution from their coal-fired power plants, and the haze of coal-fired that comes out of their uh, smokestacks would be greatly reduced. And it's very cost-effective. I mean, it's even very cost-effective for China right now on a pure health cost effect, and they're not doing it. Um, What's stopping them? I, you know, this is one of the depressing aspects of uh, looking at China, and more so India, actually, which is there isn't, even the, quote, central government doesn't have that much control. So as much as the central government keeps announcing we're not going to build uh, pulverized coal plants that, that don't have certain technologies on them, local governments keep building them. Uh, and so China does not have the centralized control over everything that's going on that I think people in the US, I don't think the more sophisticated, because when I talk to people who actually negotiate with China, they say this is a problem. Uh, but I think that we as a country sort of have this view that China as a central, act, a central government actor can just make it happen. And it turns out that it's difficult to do. The pollution coming out of one plant moves to another area and causes horrible smog in another area, and it's very tough to stop that cycle. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, where is, uh, Gary, Malaysian, where is our uh, innovation frontier in California, and how do we, how do we promote that? Yeah, so you notice that part was sort of shorter in my talk. Um, and I, and you know, I'm not an innovation expert. I can tell you that um, we have examples, and the California Regenerative Medicine uh, Institute example, I think, is a great one, where we said, look, the federal government should be doing this, but they're not. Um, we have a lot of expertise in this state. Uh, we, would, we are going to put some money in which is fairly small money, by the way, compared to what we're spending right now on all of the renewable energy initiatives. And, um, and certainly, uh, that it could have a pretty big impact. And we're going to run proposal, uh, proposals for new technologies. We are going to support downstream, but we're going to support downstream with the question, what are we learning from this? Uh, so, you know, I think the fact that, Cal that the United States is not building pilot carbon capture and sequestration plants is just a fiasco. I mean, this is a technology that you may not like as the best solution, but if we could make it work, would be a really significant step. And we abandoned the plant that was going to be built in Illinois. And for a couple billion dollars, we could make, learn a tremendous amount about how effective that would be, and we're not doing it. Uh, you know, likewise, again, I'm not sure how much of this would happen in California. Uh, modular nuclear plants is another technology that's politically unpopular, but it's nuts that we're not spending more money learning more about it. Likewise, uh, a lot of new solar technologies that, and biofuels technologies that are coming down the pike right now with, uh, uh, and I, I, last night I was at the 
alumni gala of the Berkeley Energy and Resources Collaborative. This is the organization of Berkeley graduate students. Um, and so these are people who came through the law school and the business school and the engineering school mostly, and now are in the business world. And I had two different former students tell me about their biofuels companies. And in very cost-driven ways, they weren't saying, oh, we, can, we know how to do this because listening to science t scientists tell you that XYZ can be done is not all that exciting until you then get to the number of what it costs. And they're very focused on that. They're very focused. One of them said, we are at $3 a gallon right now. Um, we, want, we need to get to $1.50 a gallon. He actually understands the energy content adjustment and the reality that there's a big build out that would be necessary. Uh, supporting those sorts of initiatives, I think, has a potentially huge payoff, and we're not doing very much of it. Hi, uh, my name's Deborah. I just had a, a question about your Kodak analogy. Um, it seemed like you were saying you should just focus money on R&D and then kind of hope emissions fall as a byproduct of that. So is that, is that what you're saying? And also, do you think there should be so much focus on like, measuring emissions and quantifying them and setting up accounting systems and stuff like that? I actually think it's very important to measure emissions. I think focusing on measuring California's emissions has led us astray in many ways. First of all, every time you get into California emissions, and I'm on the Emissions Market Assessment Committee of the California Air Resources Board, and we just wrote a study of this, uh, you then start have to, you have to start talking about life cycle analysis and what does this do, and not sort of the simple-minded life cycle analysis of following this molecule of oil through the system, but the market-driven life cycle analysis of what happens when you buy this oil and that shifts, which is just part of the, it's re closely related, it's the same as the indirect land use discussion. So all of that has to be in there, um, and I think measurement is incredibly important. That said, um, I think that simply saying California will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, is, turns out not to be very useful. And I'll give you an example of what's going on right now in the cap and trade market. Um, it turns out as much as California would like to make uh, reshuffling illegal and is talking, and there are discussions of it, some sorts of reshuffling being illegal, you can't really make it illegal. Um, electricity is electricity. It sort of flows where it wants to flow. Uh, and so you can't say you can't buy that electron, but you can buy that electron, um, even if you wanted to. So the real effect question is, what's California's cap and trade market doing in electricity in the Western grid? Because we are just part of that Western grid. Um, and it turns out that reshuffling is going to be a huge problem in the California market. Um, there is going to be an immense amount of simply relabeling what comes into California as the cleaner stuff, well, um, just, well, production continues of dirty stuff. Not 100%. It may close down a couple coal plants in the rest of the West. Um, but uh, it's very hard to directly tie it. And I think that's turning out to be less effective uh, than people thought. Uh, I'd like to hear more about uh, energy efficiency policies, uh, what you would suggest, what you think could be done, and is, is this just considered less exciting to think about, yeah. <laughs> or is, do you think there's more potential? Oh, I think there's a lot of potential. I think it's definitely less exciting. Um, I don't know why. It's very exciting for me. My colleagues at the Energy Institute are sort of sick of me talking about all the little experiments I run at home and the spreadsheet I have of where every light bulb was installed in every outlet. Um, uh, so I get excited about that, obviously. Um, but the fact is that it's not a technology that people can show off in the same way you can show off solar panels or wind turbines. Um, and that's been a real problem. Uh, it's also not, I think it, like CFLs 20 years or 30 years ago, it's been sort of oversold uh, for two reasons. One is energy efficiency just isn't as effective as the engineering numbers that are often thrown around. That's not a reason we shouldn't do it, but it is a reason we need more careful analysis of effectiveness of energy efficiency. 
That said, I mean, there is a huge amount of energy lost through inefficient operations. And the potential, and this is where I keep coming back to, the potential for exporting that to the developing world is huge. Um, so thinking about not just how can we improve energy efficiency in our homes and businesses, but how can we improve energy efficiency in a factory in Mumbai, um, and does what we do here map over to that, I think is incredibly important. Um, I, I think when we talk about where can the innovation be done, we have to talk about building materials as much as we talk about solar panels. One last question. Okay. Hi, my name is Rafael. Um, I have a question. What do you think is the best way to incentivize um, people and the industry to invest in, in energy efficiency? Because, um, you know, if there's no incentive, why should anyone invest? Like, like right now, um, I, I believe that energy is still very, very cheap, especially uh, when you compare it to other countries. For example, in Germany, a gallon of gas costs around $10 and a kilowatt hour of electricity is like 35 cents. So this increases you know, your natural incentive even back home to, to um, save energy. Do you think the price is a way or are there any other, because you said taxing, increasing the taxes is difficult, are there any other ways to incentivize people? Yeah, well let me, let me by the way comment on German electricity prices. It is true that residential German electricity prices are in the 30 plus cents. Uh, industrial are down at our level. Uh, Germany has a strategy of, uh, of trying to maintain, and they're facing the same problem, it's a good illustration, maintaining competitiveness of their industrial sector while trying to incent energy efficiency. Um, I think that we do need to, uh, it would be great to have a um, coherent policy on pricing energy that reflects the externalities and the need to improve uh, efficiency. Uh, we don't right now. Now some people face incredibly high marginal prices, some people face very low marginal prices because of these increasing block structures, and most people don't understand even what price they face. Um, that said, a lot of energy efficiency failures are not just due to price, they're due to a lack of information. That's not true on the gasoline side. I, I should say this. On gasoline, I think the evidence and my own introspection, but more importantly, real research, says people actually understand how much gas costs and they trade off the price of a new car versus the price of the gasoline that it's going to use pretty efficiently. There's pretty strong evidence of that. In electricity, that's just not true. Um, electricity is the least salient thing that we consume. We don't know when we're consuming it, we don't know how much we're consuming of it, and almost no one understands how much it costs. Uh, so information to make people more aware of what is a more efficient uh, product is very important. Um, those yellow tags on the refrigerators tell you, you know, you can buy this refrigerator, but here's how much it's going to cost you to run it. You know, those yellow tags did not always exist. 30 years ago, there were no yellow tags on refrigerators. 30, yeah, maybe a little more than 30. Um, and when you bought a refrigerator, you had no idea, particularly since it's an appliance that cycles, uh, even if you knew what its kilowatt rating was, you had no idea how much electricity it was going to actually use. That sort of information, I think, we could do a lot more with still on the electricity side. And since I told you I'm a nerd who keeps track of these things, I will tell you that if you have a high-definition cable box and a DVR at home, you are, use, it's, you are essentially leaving a 40-watt light bulb on all the time. That's what that's doing. To put that in context, if you have a new refrigerator, it's about the same as your new refrigerator. Your DVR and, K, and HD cable box is using as much electricity as a refrigerator does. And most people don't know that. By the way, the first generation cable boxes alone, without the DVR, were using almost that much until people started making a stink about it and they made them somewhat more energy efficient. But that was a great example of where the cable company was giving you the box and they didn't pay for the electricity, so they had very little incentive to make it more energy efficient until that information got out there. And I'll bet most of you, unlike me, do not own a kilowatt 
which is a watt meter, and don't run around your house plugging everything into it. So now I've shared that information with you. <laughs> yeah, as a last comment, yes. Thank you very much. I guess we have a break now, or? Just a minute while we, while we get the uh, next panel up. Thanks so much, Severin. Thanks. Really appreciate it.